turn, uh, it is now the turn uh, of Dr. Tiago Reis. Uh, Tiago is head of nephrology and kidney transplantation at the Clinica de Doenças Renais de Brasilia in Brazil. Is researched at the Laboratory of Molecular Pharmacology at the University of Brasilia and has been affiliated and is still uh, uh, with the International Renal Research Institute of Vicenza, Italy, and uh, he is member of the Brazilian Society of uh, Nephrology. So, Tiago, welcome back uh, to Vicenza, although in a virtual form, and uh, please give us uh, your uh, knowledge and experience on the use of absorption for uh, liver uh, support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the invitation, and thank you, Jeffrey, for sponsoring this activity. I will share my screen. So I will try to cover briefly in 40 minutes all the access aspects of absorption therapy for liver support. These are my conflict of interests. And first, covering hyperammonemia. So uh, there is this phenomenon that occurs in the brain, in the astrocytes, when we have high concentrations of ammonia. It gets uh, together with glutamate, making glutamine, which has a osmotic property and causes an inflow of fluid from the interstitial space towards the astrocyte creating brain edema. So this is a serial threatening condition. And when uh, usually ammonia is above 200 micromoles per liter, we advise to start CRT irrespective of AKI. Uh, first with a high flow phase, uh, an effluent of 90 ml kilograms per hour to keep ammonia below 100. And then a maintenance phase uh, with an effluent of around 35 ml uh, kilogram per hour. Uh, this is the statement of the last guidelines for liver failure. So CRT should always be undertaken in critical ill patients with acute liver failure as opposed to intermittent hemodialysis. So the preferred modality for those patients is uh, CRT. And this is an example in the machine. So uh, here is the dialysis flow, 5,000 miles per hour, replacement only 300 miles per hour, and in an effluent in this case here was 79 ml per kilogram per hour. So diffusive clearance mainly. This is the representation of the machine. So you can see the pump from a, a dialysate and the effluent uh, spinning fast uh, with those that, that high, high dose. Uh, Hyperbilirubinemia and bile acids. Uh, so this uh, slide shows that bile, bile acids, they have a path through a transmembrane receptor, which can activate a, a pro apoptotic path. So uh, bile acids, they can be toxic to the liver itself when they accumulate. And of course, to uh, renal tubule cells causing bile cast nephropathy. And in those patients, there was this debate if it, uh, we could use citrate anticoagulation and data shows that it's safe so in this analysis, including a thousand patients, uh, those that had normal lactate, less than 1% had signs of citrate accumulation. Those with elevated lactate, only 2% had signs of accumulation. And those with persistent elevated uh, lactate, only 6% had a citrate accumulation. So it's a rare phenomenon. It mainly occurs in patients with severe sustained hyperlactatemia but not in patients with liver failure. So tests for liver failure, they are not predictable. Uh, they're not, they are not good predictors for citrate accumulation. So we can claim that citrate is safe in liver failure. About the liver support systems. So first with hemoperfusion, we have these two cartridges, uh, BS330 and HA3302, and they can remove via adsorption this range of molecules in this range of molecular weight. And this is the representation of the beads, uh, which are porous beads. And inside those porous, uh, that we have the phenomenon of adsorption. So bilirubins and bilaxids, they get trapped. And the pore size determines the selective range of each of those different cartridges. 
So the pore size here is of paramount importance. The electron scan microscopy of those tiny beads. So this is the representation of the bead itself. And this is the surface of it with those pores. And now the representation of the extracorporeal circuit for DP mass. So it's a therapy that, ta that takes like two to three hours, two to three times a week. Uh, the blood flow in the circuit is from 100 to 150 miles per minute. So the blood goes in this way, passes through the pump, gets the citrate coming here in this part, and then goes through a plasma filter that directs 30% uh, of the plasma to a parallel limb of the circuit. Then we have another pump for the plasma. And finally, passing through BS330 and then HA330, finally returning here in the deoration chamber, going back to the patient. So this is a representation of DP mass here in the circuit in the diapact uh, machine. We can also apply both therapies, DP mass and CRT in parallel at the same time. So we can place a Y connector in the catheter, in the arterial line of the catheter, and then simultaneously uh, 120 miles per minute of blood going through the CRT circuit, uh, let's say in a patient with hyperammonemia, and in parallel, 120 miles per minute going through the DPMA uh, circuit. And then finally here, they return to the patient with another Y port. Another treatment is the PAP plasma adsorption perfusion, which is an albumin free, you don't need to replace albumin to the patient. Uh, so uh, the catheter here, the blood goes, passes through the blood pump, and then a plasma filter that directs 30% of plasma through a cartridge, this cartridge here, and then they merge with the rest of the blood in the bubble trap. So here in the left is the plasma filter, in the middle, the cartridge, here's the machine, the warmer for the plasma, uh, here is a representation of the blood flow, 150 miles per minute, and here is the whole circuit. So the plasma, filter, and the cartridge. This is the treatment, in, and in the left we have the blood pump, and here is the pump for the plasma after it passes through the plasma filter before going to the cartridge. Another treatment for liver support is MARS, that stands for Molecular Absorptant Recirculating System. So MARS has uh, four uh, components. So here is the high flux filter in which the blood goes from up to down here uh, and inside capillary fibers. And in the dialysate space, we have a solution of albumin. This albumin is not now, uh, it's dirty, let's say like this, and passes through a pump and then goes into a low flux dialyzer. But in this case, the albumin goes inside the fiber and in the outside is a, a normal dialysate solution. Uh, this albumin passes through a car activate charcoal uh, cartridge and then a ion exchange cartridge. So this is the activate charcoal. This is the ion exchanger. And then it's, uh, let's say, purified to go again in this loop. So this is a representation of the circuit. And one downside of this therapy is, is the need for uh, albumin, six, um, 600 mLs uh, of albumin. Another treatment is the SPAD, that stands for Single Pass Albumin Dialysis. In this case, it's a normal CRT machine, normal CRT treatment, however, here that I'm pointing down in the green scale, we have a solution of 3% albumin instead of a normal dialysate. Then the representation of the extracorporeal circuit, imagine if the blood is coming from the left to the right, so the blood goes in this direction, gets citrate, passes through the blood pump, and then here is the dialyzer. The albumin 3% solution as a dialysate solution goes in countercurrent, with the blood, and then the blood passes through the warmer, bubble trap, gets calcium compensation, and returns to the patient. Uh, a recent paper published in Blood Purification compared patients that were submitted to SPED and then cross over to MARS, and the results uh, uh, showed that the reduction of bilirubin pre and post-session were equivalent 
both in the group SPAD uh, and in MARS. So we don't have uh, clinical uh, outcomes comparing patients submitted to both modalities, but at least for this surrogate marker, so bilirubin, they, those treatments uh, are uh, equivalent. And uh, one advantage of SPAD is that you can apply it in any service when you have, you just need to have a CRT machine. Uh, so it, it's, it's more widely available, let's say like that. Another uh, therapy for patients with liver failure is plasmapheresis. So this was the statement in the guidelines. Uh, plasmapheresis has been shown to improve transplant-free survival in patients with acute liver failure. This was based on the results of this trial conducted from 98 to 2010 with five centers, 182 individuals with uh, liver failure and at least grade two uh, encephalopathy. They were randomized to receive standard care or standard care plus high volume plasma phrases, meaning to exchange 12 liters of plasma in three consecutive days. It was demonstrated that uh, so in, in this uh, figure, in the x-axis, we have the time after the treatment was initiated, and here the cumulative survival. So in patients that were submitted in the end to liver transplant, there was no difference if they performed or not previously plasmapheresis. However, in those patients that were not submitted to liver transplant, those here that uh, uh, had uh, treatment with uh, high volume plasmapheresis had a better outcome when compared to patients here, the downline that were not submitted to, that did not carry uh, plasma phrases. So this is briefly the representation of the circuit. Bloods get citrate, blood pump, and then here is the plasma filter, not a dialyzer anymore. And then before the blood returns to the patient, we have a replacement solution. In this case, for liver failure patients, we replace here uh, fresh frozen plasma. Uh, this trial in China compared DP mass versus plasma freezes in patients with hepatitis B and acute liver failure. And as a secondary outcome, so exploratory findings, the sample size was not calculated to these outcomes. However, there were no difference in, in mortality comparing patients that were submitted to plasma freezes, 33 versus 14 to DP mass. And finally, this... Uh, paper uh, from, from Italy compared three modalities of liver support. So PAP, plasma adsorption perfusion, plasma phrases, and MARS. It was a retrospective analysis. So 66 patients that performed PAP, 15 plasma exchange, and 14 MARS. And regarding the reduction in bilirubin before and after the treatment, we can see that for PAP, it was around 30%, PAX 27%, and MARS 26%. So they were equivalent. There were no statistical difference in the reduction of bilirubin comparing these three modalities. And the authors conclude that based on costs and duration of treatment, we suggest that PAC could be considered as a first-line approach for patients with hyperbilirubinemia. Um, so I uh, thank you for your attention. Let's move forward. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Tiago, for your very nice overview. Uh, I have an immediate question to ask you, just to make people understanding. What is the difference uh, between PAP and DP mass? Except uh, that in one case you have one cartridge and in the other you have two cartridges. What is the the mechanism and the difference? Well. Uh... Adding an additional cartridge to the circuit, uh, in the case that HA330, uh, uh, amplifies your magnitude of removal because now with this other cartridge, another range of molecules can be removed, uh, mainly inflammatory molecules that are involved in patients with uh, acute decompensated liver failure. So th this would be the ad additional to uh, your already capacity to remove bilirubin or, and uh, bile acids. Why these uh, uh, cartridges cannot be placed in direct contact with blood? Because this would increase the risk for, for clotting. So an intelligent solution was to uh, uh, use only plasma and uh, avoid the use of albumin, that would be also a, a solution. So this is uh, 
an intelligent way to overcome the problem of uh, clotting. Okay, so the, now what would be the, the, the ideal candidate for you to undergo this uh, type of liver support therapy? Well, uh, as we have in the guidelines, if we if we uh, detect that the patient has higher concentrations of ammonia, certainly CRT, and to modulate inflammatory response, uh, applying a cartridge such as HA330, and uh, to aiming to remove bilirubin and bilirubin, uh also the BS330. So I think an ideal treatment could be be doing in parallel, so CRT with DP mass. We have done in our laboratory a series of experiments showing that uh, the capacity of uh, the uh, cartridge to remove bilirubin is very high and uh, it can continue uh, up to 12 hours of usage. Um, what is your recommended uh, timing of application and duration of application? Well, based on data from the ERCOL trial that was performed in, in Italy, it was a different cartridge, but they've demonstrated that after six hours, the concentrations of bilirubin pre and post cartridge were the same. So uh, demonstrating that the cartridge was already uh, saturated. So I would say something between uh, six to 12 hours. It depends, of course, on the concentration of the solute because the isotherm that governs saturation of the cartridge depends on the flow you're using and depends on the initial concentration. The higher is the concentration, the sooner the uh, uh, saturation may occur. Now, one question, uh, what blood flow would you advise and what plasma flow would you advise and what is the amount of plasma that in your opinion should be circulated? Well, so um, blood flow, I would say 150 uh, miles per minute. So in this case, we have uh, around 120 miles per minute of plasma passing through the plasma filter and then we've, we direct 30 mLs per minute, that would give us, give us a f uh, uh, filtration fraction of 30%, which is okay not to, to uh, avoid clotting if, if we go further, let's say 40% of filtration fraction. So a blood flow of 150, a plasma in the parallel limb of 30 mLs per minute, and treating around five liters of blood that usually uh, of plasma that usually equivalent to 1.5 volumia of plasma of those patients. And in this settings, the therapy, the session would take like three to four hours, I'd say. Uh, do you have a preferred anticoagulant in this case? Yes, I, I, I am a completely fan of citrate. So uh, I think it's safe, we have already data for, for that, and so I would advise using 4% sodium citrate uh, as an anticoagulant. But isn't that true that uh, if you have a liver failure, citrate cannot be easily converted and you have a risk of accumulation? Yes, there, there is this, this risk, but as citrate is also metabolized in, uh, in the musculature, also in the kidneys themselves, so uh, we, we can measure, a, and we are dealing with short sessions of 6 to 12 hours. We, uh, we, we would expect citrate accumulation in CRT for, let's say, 48 hours, 72 hours, and we can measure those parameters every 6 hours. So uh, I think we, we can predict if citrate will accumulate or not. One last question. What would be your ideal candidate for... Uh, endpoints uh, uh, in case of uh, a, a randomized study? So uh, as endpoints, I would say uh, three day, uh, ventilatory three days, uh, I would say uh, days without drugs in the ICU without vasopressors, um, days without sedation, and in especially in liver failure, liver failure patients, uh, neurological outcomes. 
So days without sedation, um, uh, sequel after uh, patients are, are are outside the hospital. So I will I will, I will use this as as uh, outcomes. Okay, I think uh, we have come to the conclusion of this uh, sponsored symposium. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Araki for presenting her experience, Dr. Tiago for uh, uh, the nice overview and the nice uh, question and answer uh, interaction. So let's go back to the uh, scientific uh, program of the 39 Vicenza course on AKI and CRRT.